In the new book, The Industries of the Future, author Alec Ross takes a deep dive into the specific fields that will shape our economic future, including robotics and the codification of just about everything. The book is based in part on his four years serving as senior advisor for innovation to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Alec, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Now, when you were coming up with these industries to highlight in the book, was it immediately obvious what would make sense to put in there, or how was your process of figuring out either what ones to include or just how to kind of mush together the things that you were seeing into clear industries? It was actually, it was a long process, actually. Uh, My assistant actually totaled up my travel, and apparently over the last handful of years, I've traveled the equivalent of two round trips to the moon with a side trip to New Zealand. And so the process of identifying the, you know, let's call them eight to 10 specific industries that I profile in the industries of the future really is a byproduct of that travel, 25 circumferences of the globe. So, you know, some of the ideas that I had going in didn't stick. And then there were things like the commercialization of genomics, which I would not have necessarily intuited. Will be it would be a trillion dollar industry in the future, but by virtue of my research, it emerged. Now, one of the things I thought was really fascinating about the book is you kind of see two different things at work here. You see economies, emerging economies, where they're kind of developing industries from the ground up that are these cutting edge, cutting edge industries, and then you also see more developed economies where they had had their economies were basically shaped on the innovations of the past, the innovations of decades ago, and they're having to retool. And what were the lessons you took from each of those? I mean, do you see, is the process somehow different? Is it easier for one versus the other to focus on these things? I I think that the process of imagination that becomes innovation, which becomes commercialization, uh, is fairly similar uh, country to country. But the problem is is that different countries have the wherewithal, have the access to capital, have the employee base to take something from imagination to reality, and others don't. Uh, So in the most highly developed countries, you do have baked in a set of advantages that don't exist in frontier markets or in developing economies. So more often than not, I think it's in in the developed economies. Uh, It's in places like Silicon Valley where they're going to create entirely new platforms that billions of people will eventually use. Whereas in developing economies, at least to this point, and it could change, in developing economies, it's been the case that that what I see is building a tool, building an application, Mm -hmm. developing something that that solves a very specific problem as opposed to building platforms that serve hundreds of millions of people. So for those economies, it's more about if they take, can they take the tool and really develop an industry around that or an industry around that type of innovation? That's exactly right. So when I think about mobile payments and how mobile payments emerged in Kenya, now the reason why mobile payments emerged in Kenya was in part because there weren't mainstream right. banks on Main Street, Nairobi. Uh, and so it was innovation born out of scarcity. But the interesting thing there is because it's so good and because it appeals to consumers around the world. It's something that can scale from developing economies into developed economies. So there are examples of that. Now, one of the things I thought was interesting was when you look at developed economies. So for example, you talk a little bit in the book about your background growing up in West Virginia and about how what happened to the community when coal kind of became not a dominant industry anymore when it moved overseas to to other places. And I wondered with for developed economies, like, and I actually lived in a place very similar to that in Indiana, which had been an industrial economy. And one of the things that I found interesting is, is that the government tried to kind of pivot to something, to something new, to what was coming next. But you have kind of this pushback from the population that, you know, they want the jobs back that were there before. They want it to be the way it was before because that was very sustainable. It made a good life for, you know, generations of people. So with developed economies, how do you kind of get beyond, how did you see governments or people trying to get beyond that, you know, this works for us, this works for us for years. We want this back. We don't want something new. We want the old because the old was good. Yeah, I mean, look, I think one of the lessons of the past 40 years of globalization is that you can't click your heels together and say there's no time like 1965. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. And it's it's regressive. Uh, And, you know, those kinds of that kind of regressive worldview, uh, when it becomes a regressive set of policies, tends to lead to nowhere. Uh, in West Virginia, for example, I think, you know, one of the reasons why I wrote The Industries of the Future was because, was as a response to how poorly 
the state of West Virginia uh, did respond to globalization and technology-driven innovation and, you know, sort of clung on to coal, uh, even as coal became automated. Uh, and so, look, I, I think that you've got – this is where leadership is, is necessary. Um, you know, people cannot – curl into the fetal position and, and, you know, wish for the prosperity of, of yesterday. You know, it's not the strongest of the species that survives or the most intelligent, but those most adaptable to change. And that's as true in, you know, the highest, in the, in the most highly developed Western economies as it is anywhere. Now, you talk a little bit about how that people always ask you, for example, like, how do I become Silicon Valley? How does my community become Silicon Valley? And your answer is they can't, that you can't be Silicon Valley because Silicon Valley had a special set of things that made it that way. But what you can do is sort of become, take the deep knowledge in your own in your own community and leverage that. Now, how would you say, I mean, if you have, an so for example, if you have a community like Detroit, where their deep knowledge is in automobiles, and in some sense, some of the, that that's become antiquated, that's become developments of the past and some of the things that they're doing. How would you, how do you pivot an industry like that that's very much based on the innovations of yesterday and kind of focus them on some of these industries that you talk about in the book? I mean, what do you see economies, do you see economies that are doing that well? Well, first, you know, let's go right back to Detroit. So the skill sets that uh, are domiciled inside Detroit lend themselves well to, in my opinion, the next generation of automobiles, which will be increasingly internet connected, which will be driverless. You know, they ought to assert their own domain expertise in automotive so that they can be a part of that economy tomorrow. But secondly, you know, again, sticking to Detroit, there are going to be emerging fields like drones. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's Mark, and, Mark Andreessen from the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz suggested that Detroit become Drone Valley. So if you do think, if you take the industry out of it, you know, the car industry, but think about what the skills were that made Detroit what it was for as long as it was, that then can lend itself uh, to a set of, you know, future-oriented industries. You know, when I think about the Rust Belt more broadly, I think about deep domain expertise in manufacturing. Well, there are, you know, supply chains are growing more sophisticated. Uh, advanced manufacturing is growing more sophisticated. There is the emergence of 3D printing. So I actually think that the domain expertise in manufacturing in the Rust Belt could be turned to its advantage so long as it's oriented towards the industries of the future. Now, do you see that type of deep thinking going on in some of these economies, like in the U.S. and Europe? I mean, are are there people out there that are thinking about this that way? Is there isn't there enough thought being put into that? To that, I actually think there is. You know, I actually, you know, look. Most people who write books about the future are either wildly utopian or wildly dystopian. It's either oh, we're going to live 150 years happy, healthy, wealthy, wise, and lack for nothing, or it's written, you know, with sort of fists clenched and eyes closed, right. you know, very angry. You know, I think the life is much more up the middle. And when I think about, you know, your question here about, you know, are communities preparing themselves to pivot and leverage their domain expertise? I actually think yes. Um, you know, where I live now in Baltimore, there's a very strong focus on the commercialization of genomics, the life sciences based on, uh, you know, the tremendous research institutions that are there. It's close to... Uh, the NSA and the CIA and the Defense Department. So there's a big focus on cybersecurity. Uh, I d actually do think that communities have grown smarter and smarter about mapping their assets and figuring out how to how to build industries around those assets. Now, as these sectors rise, I mean, as robots and codification and all of these other industries that you identify in the book r become more prominent, how do you feel like that's going to kind of change the world balance of power? I mean, how does that change kind of the global economy and who's who's got power and who doesn't? Well, that's a tremendous question. You know, I, I would first of all, I'd put it into into a certain kind of binary. I mean, so the first is within the architecture of the 196 sovereign nation states, and the second is within those nation states, you know, what kinds of individuals do well and what kinds of individuals do poorly. So you can live in a country that is prospering, but you can be doing very well, or you could be doing very poorly, or you could be living, living in a country that's foundering and you might be able to be doing pretty well. So first, I think that, you know, the principal political and economic binary of the 20th century was right versus left. 
in the 21st century, I think it's open versus closed, defining open as upward economic mobility, not confined to elites, uh, social and cultural norms, social, cultural, and religious norms not set from a central authority, and sort of broadly rights respecting for women, minorities of all type, and what have you. And I believe that the centers of innovation and the wealth creation and job creation that comes from that will be in the more open societies uh, for the industries of the future. I, I see, you know, people conglomerating around, you know, what will probably be 10 to 15 major centers uh, over the next 15 years. We already see this in development now. And so I think that the more open societies will be those that compete and succeed most effectively. Uh, in terms of the individuals, looking at this on an individual level, I think, you know, look, it's going to be a terrible time to be mediocre at your job if you're in a high-cost labor market. Um, you know, it's, it's an absolutely br brutal truth. When people in Baltimore are competing against people in Bangalore, not just based on cost of labor but also quality of labor, which is now increasingly going to be the case, uh, I think that, you know, being born middle class or working class in the United States or Western Europe isn't going to mean you're starting life on second base to the degree that it did in the past. Right. And, and so I do think that uh, you, you've got to be a committed lifelong learner. You've got to be adaptable. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be left behind even if you're even if your country is producing substantial growth. And you point that out in the last chapter of the book, you talk a little bit about kind of advice if you're a parent with mm -hmm. children these days and you have three, correct? I do. And so what what to do? Like if you have kids who are maybe even if they're decades away from college or a few years away, like what do you suggest? How do you kind of guide them? What would How can they adjust to this new type of economy? And you have some interesting advice and part of it's with languages. Mm -hmm. And I think the other interesting part was just the idea that it's more important than ever to have stamps on your passport, which is something I never experienced as a kid. And something I definitely got me thinking, well, this is something I need to make a point of making sure my daughter does. But You know, it's really interesting. Uh, there was a World Economic Forum study that said that children entering preschool today, 65% of the job types that exist when they graduate from college don't exist today. So what that means is that we aren't preparing our kids for specific jobs. Rather, what we have to do is develop a set of skills they can then map into job types that we don't even know what they are right now. And so there are, you know, in the last chapter of the Industries of the Future, the, the last chapter is called The Most Important Job You'll Ever Have, and The Most Important Job You'll Ever Have Being a Parent. And so without pretending to be a parenting guru myself, what I did do is I interviewed the scores of people who've been very successful in business and said, all right, you know, what are the skills and attributes that today's kids need in tomorrow's economy? And there are a handful of lessons in there from foreign language learning to interdisciplinary learning to, you know, making sure that kids are as multiculturally fluent as possible because they're going to be working in a world where the frontier economies are becoming developing economies and the developing com economies are becoming developed economies. So it's going to be a little bit of a tricky world, I think, for kids my age. They're 13, 11, and 9 when they enter the workforce. Um, and it's never too early to begin to prepare them for that. And now, in addition, when you talk about languages, you also talked a lot about preparing them languages including code. So mm -hmm. including learning HTML, learning Python, learning some sort of technological mm -hmm. language in addition to a foreign language. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of language learning, foreign languages and computer languages. And, you know, even if the computer languages that kids are learning are not necessarily those that will be used in 15 years, uh, it still teaches you a way of thinking. It teaches you a way of problem solving. And an above average coder, uh, he's got a couple decades uh, worth of employment in front of him. Right. Now, if you are so looking at people like our age or mm. people or companies, I mean, if you're somebody who has maybe had a company that's built on or your career is built on one of maybe the old the innovations of the past, mm -hmm. how do you prepare for the future? How can you take this book and really use it as almost like news you can use? I mean, what would your advice be to older folk? Oh, I hate gosh. To call myself old, oh but. gosh, you know, look, I, I think that any, I think that anybody <laughs> from, you know, from middle schoolers to people toward the end of their professional careers hopefully can draw something uh, from the book The Industries of the Future. Um, but you know, one of, one of the things that I would simply say is, you know, I'm I'm such an evangelist for lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, you know, that somehow stops in your 40s or your 50s, you know, I, 
I simply don't buy or buy into. Um, so I do, I do think that people who are trying to figure out how to adopt and adapt to a faster changing world, you know, I say the 21st century is a terrible time to be a control freak. So one of the key things is to give up on the kind of control that you're most comfortable with and, you know, begin to understand that a lot of the ground shifting under your feet is going to shift whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And to under, ex understand and accept that we're, we're going to be living in a world of ever faster paced change. Alec Ross, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you.